Ladies and gentlemen, however you are listening, wherever you are listening, thank you so much once again for joining the All Steelers Talk podcast. Go ahead and follow us on Twitter at SI underscore Steelers. Go ahead and give us a like on YouTube at All Steelers Talk. And then go ahead and give me a follow on Twitter at Donnie and Drew. And today I am joined by two members of the Around the 412 podcast, closely on their way to 10,000 followers on Twitter. Go ahead and give them a follow at Around the 412. Today I'm joined by Tyler Weeks and Zachary Smith. Both of you guys, thank you so much for joining me. What's well, good? Happy to be here again. It wasn't that long ago that we were on here, so we're back. Also, yeah, also appreciate the Twitter shout out. We're only, I think, 26, 12 hours away. 25. Oh, we're I got the countdown. Li- live count on the show today. We got Dude, I, I, I am absolutely sure by the time this episode is hit and published and edited by Thursday morning, you guys will be well over that. So big congrats to you guys. You guys do a lot of phenomenal work, you know, not only for Steelers fans and, you know, Penguin Pirate fans, but for the actual community itself in Pittsburgh. So big props to you guys. And, you know, whenever Noah said he was going to be out this week, you guys were the first people that came to mind. You know, I, I didn't want anybody else. I, I wanted the boys back on the podcast. So again, thank you so much for joining me. A lot of things to talk about today, but first and foremost, the last time you guys were on, and actually this is a really good segue, we talked about the Steelers secondary being one of the big weaknesses of the Steelers team heading into 2021. Um, Steven Nelson, you know, released earlier this offseason, still a free agent. The Steelers, no, I'm not so sure on Justin Lane. I know James Pierre has a lot of hype within the organization. I'm just not sure about him. We haven't seen a big sample size from him. Um, are we sure we want Cam Sutton playing on the outside if it means any of the aforementioned two play on the inside? All of that kind of snowballs into this really big question. Would you welcome back Stephen Nelson at all? I'll answer that first. In a heartbeat. And my only reason is when I look at this cornerback room, I just see a lack of depth. You've got Cam Sutton and Joe Hayden, and after that, it's a lot of question marks. Um, and like you said, Justin Lane, James Pierre, I do not really know how much I can trust those guys to really step up and take on a big role in the Steelers' defense. Meanwhile, Steven Nelson, he's been in the system. He was with the Steelers for a couple of years. He was a starting corner and did very well under the Steelers. So I think to alleviate some of that depth problems, I would welcome him back instantly. How bad is it that I don't even think about Justin Lane when I think about the Steelers' cornerbacks? Like, we're talking about, like, I really, honestly, like, you said Joe Hayden, Cam Sutton, James Pierre, while he is a huge question mark, like, and it's really just, if you think that he's going to be a good player, it's pretty much at this point just all optimism and hope. Like, yeah. played 30-some snaps last yeah, year. Which, which really, isn't bad, because from, yeah. from the small amount of snaps we did see last year, he did play well. You yeah, know, I mean, at the very, at the very do least, that over a 17 regular season course, I, I don't know. At the very least, what you have is a guy that played with a lot of confidence for a guy that very well could have looked very shaky last year and looked like the player that we've seen Justin Lane look like when he's been thrown in that spot. And we didn't see that. He looked like a guy that belonged at the very least. So I do think that there's some hope for James Pierre there with Cam Sutton when James Pierre's on the, James Pierre's like a play in the slot. So if James Pierre wins the CB3 job, which is what I think happens, it means that Cam Sutton is really going to play those snaps in the slot when we three when we see James Pierre on the field and James Pierre outside opposite of Joe Hayden. When you get further down in the cornerback room, I think that's where you really start to have problems. You need like one of these UDFA guys like a Mark Gilbert or Shakur Brown. And, and for me, it's it's Gilbert um, to step up and make this roster. And probably they could surpass Lane as well. As, like I'm, as far as I'm concerned, like, like I said, I don't even consider him, you know, really much at this point. It is a huge prove a year for him to show that he has anything. Former third round pick, so there's obviously a little bit of pedigree there. Converted wide receiver who they just fell in love with the traits that he has, the size, six foot two, great wingspan, but it hasn't translated to anything else other than a special teams player at this point. And they need him to be a contributor at least in some fashion, I think. Um, so absolutely to answer your question, Steven Nelson would be a welcome addition, but it doesn't feel like the same as, you know, when they let Vince Williams go, like there could be a reunion. I just, I don't think that that's there. I think the bridges, uh, bridges have been burned when it comes to Steven Nelson, which is a shame because, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. But if they could have figured out this David DeCasher situation earlier, maybe we don't even see this happen with, with Steven Nelson and they don't have to go this route to save money. Maybe so. Yeah. And it, I think that was the big focal point of why they cut Steven Nelson. I know Joe Hayden's name was thrown out as a potential cap casualty heading to the offseason, but it turned out to be Steven Nelson. And 
Um, I, I think admittedly so. Joe Hayden did end up playing better than Stephen Nelson over the course of last season. And I think if you were going to cut any cornerback, it had to be Nelson. But, um, you know, kind of piggybacking off the point of the Castro, now that the Steelers do have money, uh, you know, it's certainly at least worth noting that they would be able to bring him back. You know, I, I think $8.6 million they got in cap relief. I, I think Trey Turner's contract was only a million and a half for one year that they brought in. Um, so definitely some cap space will go room along with the cap space they already previously had before cutting David DeCastro. So, but I, I think I agree with you. I think the bridges have already burned. And, you know, for a city with so many bridges, I do think every single one of them is already gone and torched. You know, um, it, it doesn't look like Stephen Nelson wants to come back at all. I, I think there's some legitimately ill feelings t- between Nelson and the organization. You could go through his likes on Twitter and, and realize that pretty quickly. I mean, yeah. So he is somebody that searched his name. I actually tweeted about him pretty positively the other day, and he liked it. Um, these Steeler fans just pretending like Stephen Nelson wasn't a good player here just because of how things yeah. ended. Like 2019, he was ridiculous. I think he played obviously over his skill level. He was a really good player on an elite defense. So because, you know, people weren't going to throw Joe Hayden's way. And if they did, Joe Hayden, you know, ended up with what, five, six interceptions that year. Stephen Nelson really looked like he was the better cover corner while covering number two receivers. But like I said, he had a really good year on an elite defense. Um, and people would stack his numbers up against like Stephon Gilmore, which is obviously hilarious to see looking back yeah. on it. And then, you know, 2020 didn't have the exact same year as 2019. And, you know, Joe Hayden, he missed some time as well. So there were times where Nelson was the number one corner that puts him in a different position. But then obviously the way that the, the marriage breaks up and people act like Stephen Nelson was some scrub while with his in his time at Pittsburgh. And that just it wasn't the case. He was a very good player. He was a well above average player in Pittsburgh. And if he were on the team going into 2021, I'd feel a lot more comfortable with the cornerback room. So it's not going to happen, but I don't know if you guys have seen this. I'm seeing, you know, like people say he's probably going to take like a one year deal for $3 million. That's going to hurt so bad to see if that happens. Probably with Philly. Honestly, I think that's how it plays out. I think he ends up in Philly. I agree. Uh, Well, I don't know about the, his destination, but I agree. That's going to suck whenever you see him sign for a one year, $3 million deal or something like that, especially because I I thought the, the bridges were burned and I didn't think the relationship ended like that well however i thought that maybe eventually after not being signed for so long he would realize the grass isn't always greener and would be more open to coming back to the steelers but i guess that's just not the case for him yeah he he did mention um you know kind of deep into his free agency process following being released that he had about i think he said 10 to 15 teams interested in him um, so I think there's 10 to 15 teams interested in, in all three of us as well, if, if that's actually the case moving forward. Uh, but kind of, but, but here's the thing real quick, just to wrap up on that. When you say yeah. 10 to 15 teams are interested in you, that's fine, but they're at varying price tags. Like all 32 teams probably have interest in him. Yeah. If he's going to yeah. take a minimum, minimum deal, but for what he's looking for, that might not be the case. So just want to wrap up with that when it comes to Stephen Nelson. Yeah, most definitely. You know, at least speaking from an agent standpoint as well, it never hurts to throw out that you have a bunch of teams, almost half of the league actually interested in you to, you know, pump up that price tag. But moving on from somebody who's not on the roster to somebody that is on the roster, Terrell Edmonds entering a pivotal fourth year. The Steelers did not pick up his fifth year option. There's been a lot of, you know, tinfoil hat conspiracies centered around that, whether or not the Steelers are actually intending on bringing him back following the 2021 season. I I want to talk to you guys about this, though, because Terrell Edmonds, fair or not fair, has gotten a lot of hate over his career ever since being drafted in the first round a few years back. What do you expect out of Terrell Edmonds heading to 2021? We've seen his career kind of steadily incline. He had a phenomenal year last year in terms of tackling, and I don't think anybody can question, you know, how he plays around the box and, you know, his abilities as a tackler. It's more of in the secondary and, you know, with the Steelers at least showing interest in bringing in Malik Hooker, do you think that, you know, they're actually intent on bringing Edmonds back and what do you expect out of the 2020 season, 2021 season, excuse me, season for him? I'll let you go, Tyler. So I, I think that they could potentially be interested in bringing him back. I think the big thing about declining that fifth year option is that they just did not want to pay the price tag that was going to be on that fifth year option. Um, but from what I expect from Terrell Edmonds, I think that he's great inside the box, like you mentioned. I just think his biggest thing is he's, he has no ball skills and he needs to show that he can. I mean, we, we drafted him based off athleticism. And, I mean, we've seen some, but, like, we haven't seen that coverage skills or, like, what you would expect out of a safety. I think that is his biggest 
um, room for improvement going into the season, especially since this is a contract deal. I mean, he should be going into this year with the mindset that I'm going to ball out and I'm going to get the money that I deserve and show them that I was worth that fifth year, the fifth year option. But that's what I would expect from him to have mentality wise. What we're going to see, I'm not really sure. I mean, he has been improving year after year and been proving that he's been less of a headache of that that first round pick than we've seen like his rookie year or so. But at the same time, what are we going to see from the ball skills wise? We know he's good in the box. We need, just need to see him better in coverage. You know, Edmonds is so interesting to me because I was obviously not a huge fan of the pick, but what everybody said was if you feel like you have a day two guy, you know, round two or three, and you feel that way about the player, take him to the back end of round one is fine because then you get that fifth year option ability. Well, now that you decline that fifth year option, now it does kind of make it a huge question mark pick looking back with hindsight in 2018. The thing about him, though, is, and I've said this going back to last year, and there's no reason for me to change course because I feel the exact same way, is a lot of the same conversations that we have about Terrell Edmonds were the same ones we were having about Bud Dupree in his first few seasons. He has gotten better, as you know, I will echo you guys saying as well, each and every season, and he's really good in the box. That's why, to me, like bringing in a guy like Malik Hooker doesn't really cloud a guy like Terrell Edmonds' future at all because he's a completely different player. It would just allow the defense to give some different looks, maybe put, you know, because we have such a question at cornerback, maybe use Minka as like a slot cornerback at times, have Malik Hooker, you know, play that deep safety instead of Minka, and then you still have Edmonds on the other side of him. So all three of those guys could be on the field at times. I don't think that Malik Hooker has – you know, bringing him in would mean any indication for what Terrell Edmonds' future is. I do think the Steelers like him. I just don't think that they wanted to pick up that fifth-year option um, for two reasons. One, uh, were they going to pick up two fifth-year options in the same season, you know, because they had picked up Minkas as well. And two, again, for even though he's an improving player and he's good at what he does, I don't think he's worthy of being a top, you know, that would have made him one of the top seven paid safeties at his position. So I don't think that he's worth that for even though I am a fan of his game and I think that there is a role for what he does. Again, I think he's best in the box. He's their most short tackler. Um, what he, he was, I think he led. He definitely led the team. I think it was his lowest missed tackle percentage last year of his career. And again, this is an ascending player. I, I see no reason that year four shouldn't be his best in the league. Well, you know what? In order for him to get paid, he would certainly help. So I remember last year whenever the Steelers were kind of starving at depth that inside linebacker after a couple guys had gone oh, down. Yeah. There were there were kind of rumblings of Terrell Edmonds playing middle linebacker. And, and that almost is, you know, kind of not the ideal role, but if he's not going to play safety, if he can't, you know, play a free safety role where he can go and track footballs and make plays over the field, that would almost be an, an ideal like secondary role for him to play or at least be a backup. Because, you know, we've seen time and time again how phenomenal he is, um, you know, in just tackling in the box, you know, making sure, you know, he's able to wrap up guys and kind of, you know, plugging those holes with his, you know, athleticism that, you know, he tested out the gym when everyone through the combine coming out. I, I think my only thing for him and be fair to touch on it is, yeah, you know, his coverage is not very good at all. It feels like Edmonds is always there. And he's always like one or two steps away, but that's the difference between great NFL safeties and just good safeties is, is that one or two steps of actually being there and being able to locate a football, track it, you know, throughout the air, you know, go up and make a play with your hands on it. And that's just something we haven't really seen from Terrell Evans. I mean, two years ago, his brother who played running back had more interceptions than him and he <laughs> got Trey Edmonds got his, you know, running back interception off of a special teams play. And, you know, that's th those numbers always kind of are crazy to me. Granted, th they're not dropping him back like Minka. You know, Minka's going to have a lot more opportunity to make those plays in the air. But at the end of the day, if you want to get paid, you know, a, a lot of NFL teams, whether it be the Steelers or not, they're not going to pay a box safety. You know, it, the, the game is changing. You know, it's all about a majority passing mentality, you know, moving forward. And you know, just look at the quarterbacks coming out. You need guys that are able to cover these rocket arms that are coming out into the league left and right and throw them. And as of right now, simply can't do that. I said that last year going into 2020 was a big year for him. This year with a huge paycheck on the line, even bigger for him. But, uh, you know, it's interesting yeah, real yeah. quick is when you when you talk about, you know, box safeties and not getting paid, the only exception to that, if we were able to see Terrell Edmonds, maybe add some pass rushing chops and be like Jamal Adams, which Jamal Adams had like eight and a half sacks last year or something like that. Ridiculous for a safety. 
obviously he's not that caliber of player, but if he could add a little bit of that element, and, and the defense really doesn't deploy him that way to do that. But I would say that that's like the one exception. If you were trying to maybe mold his game after somebody, again, not going to be at that level, but maybe like a great value Jamal Adams is what we can see from. A from great throwing. value if, Jamal Adams. Yeah. You can clip that, it. by the way. I love it. Yeah, also, I that. don't think it's really a coincidence either that, Smitty, you were touching on the similarities between – uh, his career with the Steelers and Bud or Bud Dupree's with the, career with the Steelers, like starting slow and getting better each year and year. And then Donnie, you mentioned how uh, Terrell Edmonds has, he's like always in the area. He's always around, but he's like, it's like he has no finish to his game. And that's something that a lot of people said about Bud Dupree is like, he can get into the backfield, but he could just never finish the sack. He can't hit the quarterback and he's just not there. I, I maybe as with his career mirrors, Bud Dupree's, maybe he'll t- pick that up this year and maybe he'll, be able to finish in coverage this year, like kind of like Bud Dupree was able to finish in the backfield later in his career with the Steelers. And that, that's one thing that we need to remember too, is that these guys coming into the NFL, I mean, Troutman's going to his fourth year. How old is he? He's going to be what, 25, 26? Something like, like that. The, 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 the time it takes to adjust to the speed of the NFL game and kind of being thrown in from day one and learning to adjust on the fly. And let's be real. Sure. It's an elite defense right now, but Keith Butler, you know, the defensive coordinator for the Steelers, hasn't exactly had a great track record of putting players in positions to succeed. And we've seen Terrell Edmonds be abused in the handful of passing scenarios, not saying, you know, he shouldn't be able to, uh, you know, cover whether it be a tight end or, you know, whatever the you know, receiver comes to mind, because he should. You know, if, you, if you're a first-round pick, you absolutely should be able to handle those things. But, you know, we need to call it like we see it. Terrell Edmonds isn't capable of that. And for Keith Butler to – be, you know, continue to put Terrell Edmonds in those scenarios to not succeed, it sucks, you know. So it, it, the guys certainly take time, like both of you said. We saw that with Bud Dupree. Maybe we see a resurgence, you know, with Terrell Edmonds. Because remember, before the Steelers picked up Bud Dupree's fifth-year option, people were really skeptical that Dupree was going to kind of flatline and he was going to be, a you know, a formidable bust. And I remember whenever the Steelers did pick up the fifth-year option, Bud Dupree, people were losing their minds, man. So... You know, it it might be kind of the same thing here. You guys have both made very good points about the situations mirroring. And I I guess time will only tell, you know. Yeah. Indeed. But, you know, taking steps into the NFL, we saw Terrell Edmonds do it from year one to year two. Uh, With the Super Bowl window closing, if it's not already closed, for Ben Roethlisberger and the rest of the Steelers heading into 2021, a couple rookies from the 2020 class will undoubtedly need to step up and kind of leap into the next echelon of their position group. Um, you know, guys like Kevin Dotson, Chase Claypool, Alex Highsmith are all candidates heading into their second year to really grow and sprout and, you know, establish themselves as a potential longtime player in black and gold. My question for both of you is what second year player heading into this season do you think has to have the most important leap? I was just saying, let's stick on the same path with the Bud Dupree thing leaving. It's got to be Alex Highsmith for me. I mean, granted, you know what you got on one side of the defense in TJ. We know we have along that defensive line. So I don't want to say that Alex Highsmith's job is going to be easy because it's not. But there's a lot of pressure taken off him by when you look across that defensive line. Honestly, teams are probably going to disrespect him at the beginning of the season, and it's his job to make sure that it doesn't happen throughout the entire season. He has to at least adequately fill in for Bud Dupree. He doesn't have to be Bud Dupree. He's just got to be Alex Smith. I think that this is definitely a guy capable of taking that leap and showcasing that he is talented enough on his own to warrant – obviously no team's going to double-team him over T.J. Watt on the other side – but to warrant some attention – and he's going to take some attention away and still let TJ be able to win those matchups because he's been productive on the other side. And that's what I expect to see. I am, I, I can't wait. He's obviously put in the work. The one thing coming into the, you know, coming in when he came into the league was this guy needs to put on some weight. I don't know if you guys have seen this off season. I'm sure you have. We all are, you know, just so hungry for anything Steelers related this time of the year. He's added somewhere between 15 to 20 pounds of muscle. Looks like a beast. I'm so excited to watch his kid go. But when you talk about the loss of Bud Dupree for me, it's got to be Alex Highsmith taking a leap in year two. I'm just going to be riding your coattails because mine is the <laughs> same answer, Alex Highsmith. And the reasoning being, when you go through players like you mentioned, Donnie, with uh, Chase Capel, Kevin Dotson, I think for those guys, 
last year, you could argue that for a good portion of the season, Kevin Donson was playing as the best offensive lineman for the Steelers. And then Chase Claypool, we saw what, the numbers that he was putting up in the Steelers offense. Alex Highsmith is replacing Bud Dupree, and that cannot go understated. I mean, Bud Dupree was an elite pass rusher, and this is a big shoot. He should have made at least one Pro Bowl in those last two years. Yeah, uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. but that, that's a whole other argument. The, yeah. the Pro Bowl voting <laughs> is ridiculous. But go ahead. Yeah, but so so just seeing how big of shoes those are to fill, that's the guy that has to be able to step up and fill those shoes. I just think that it's such an important position, and like you said, you have TJ on the other side, but that doesn't mean that you can slack off, and that that doesn't mean that guys aren't going to come at you either. Now may, maybe they do. Uh, sleep on you a little bit in the beginning of the season, but that's when you have to step up and show them what you have to, what, what you can do. Like you said, I, I just think that that position is so important. And it's one of the positions that we talked about um, with this team a few weeks ago that there, there's not a lot of depth behind you. So w- when it comes to Alex Highsmith, like you're the guy, there's, there's really no one behind you that is really riding for that starting position. So you have to go out and show that you're worthy of being that starting outside linebacker. And I think the small amount of play we saw from Highsmith last year, he, he showed tremendous flashes. So I'm definitely excited to see Highsmith going into the year two. And I know Highsmith is actually a friend of the podcast here on the 412 show. So shout out to you guys as well for securing those interviews. Also, yeah. wait, before you go on, I do want to just yeah. say, because we haven't had him on since this, but he recently launched his own foundation. And, you know, they're doing really cool things um, where, you know, they pay for the equipment of kids and they have their own uh, football camp and everything like that. So really cool stuff that they're doing. So if you have a chance, if you're on Facebook, I know that they created a Facebook page for the Alex Highsmith Foundation. So go check them out. Good deal, man. Yeah, we, we will always plug foundations and other really good stuff here. So appreciate the shout out for that. I'm actually going to pivot away from you guys. I think Kevin Dotson needs to take the biggest leap in year two. And here's why. If Alex Highsmith is only average, I think the defense will still continue to roll like it has been. And I I hope Highsmith can fill into the shoes that he wants to. I have no doubts about his abilities as a pass rusher. He he looked great last year. I can only imagine the improvements he's going to take from year one to year two. But with all of the other great chess pieces around him, if Highsmith doesn't necessarily play great, but doesn't necessarily play awful. He's kind of in that, in that in the middle average range. I think the Steelers defense can still be a top five unit in the league. If Kevin Dotson plays average on the Steelers offensive line, a team that lost four of its five starters from last year, I think the Steelers offense is in a world of trouble. I think There's a lot of question marks around Chooks at left tackle because he didn't play phenomenal at right tackle. He's going back to left tackle. So there's still reservations held out about him. We know the kind of player Kevin Dotson is. I think the three of us were pounding the table for him to be a starter after week two last year. Yeah. And the the, the fact that he had to sit behind Matt Filer and even Wisniewski for a game, mind-blowing. But that's a whole other podcast we could probably do. Center, you're going to have a rookie in Kendrick Green. Now, granted, Kendrick Green – According to reports, it does look very good. You know, his tape was really impressive coming out of the college. If he's a starter from day one, I won't be upset. Okay. But if, if Green is not, you're looking at, at guys like BJ Finney or JC Hasnauer, who, you know, and I think we can probably just leave it at that. Not ideal. No. Right guard, you have Trey Turner, who does not have very high remarks coming from his, you know, most recent season. Uh, you know, I, I think he graded out at a pro football focus 82 out of 84 guards. Uh, one of the worst guards in the league last year. Now, granted, there was a lot of moving pieces in L.A. last year. Uh, the offensive line he played on wasn't phenomenal. He, you know, he had a rookie quarterback behind him. It was a COVID year, so he didn't get a lot of time to you know, go and practice and you know, kind of form that formidability that he could have in a uh, regular offseason. But, you know, when, when p- push comes to shove, nobody's grading training camp. Nobody's grading, you know, Zoom meetings in the offseason. They're, they're grading on-field performance, and it wasn't there for him last year. And then you go to Zach Banner at right tackle, who is coming off an ACL and an MCL tear. There's still a lot of question marks around him. Kevin Dotson right now needs to be the leader of that offensive line. If not vocally, then leading by example. If Dotson does not kind of hold up that stellar play we saw for him last year, I don't think the Steelers are going to be able to run the ball. 
I don't think they're going to be able to pass protect. And I, I just think everything starts in the middle of that line, especially the interior for the Steelers. And with three new fresh faces there, if Kevin Dotson doesn't anchor down that left side of the offensive line, I think the Steelers are going to have a really hard time moving to football this year. Yeah, I mean, when you said the top three, the top three draft selections of 2020, I think you can make a case for any of them. Well, I'm sorry, Anthony McFarland was actually drafted before Dotson, but you know what I mean, top three performers amongst rookies. <laughs> um, like, because Chase Claypool, for as good of a rookie year as he had, wasn't very good in contested catch situations, and I think that that's going to loom large this year. Um, when you talked about an offense that wants to push the ball down the field, but hopefully more in Matt Canada's offense, a guy like Chase Claypool really needs to bring out that of him. If there's one thing that you're expecting in a second year lead from Chase Claypool, it's probably in that aspect. Um, I absolutely can can echo your sentiments about Kevin Dodson because that offensive line, we all are very skeptical of it. We were skeptical of it with David Castro here, you know, when we thought yeah. he was going to be healthy to start the season. Now you bring in another new piece in Trey Turner, not to mention that they have a new offensive line coach, which He's getting high remarks, but, you know, again, at this point, if you are hopeful that this offensive line is going to be better than last year's, it's just that. It's hope. It's optimism. There's no reason to believe that that 100% can be the case. Trey Turner, you mentioned how bad he was last year. It, it, I think it was mainly due to injuries. Before that, made five Pro Bowl seasons in a row. Hurts his knee going into last year. Plays one game coming back from that knee injury and then hurts his groin and then has to play through that for the rest of the year. So hopefully he's healthy. But again, that's just another question mark. And that's what this offensive line is across the board is question marks. So if you are looking at one guy in that offensive line, Kevin Dodson, again, like Tyler said, I think has the argument to be there was their best offensive lineman last year. He needs to be that again this year. Yeah, I agree with you, and I, I hate to break it for every Steeler fan listening to this. Just because they drafted Najee Harris does not mean that the O-line can slack <laughs> off. I don't care how good of a running back you have back there. If your offensive line is not going to be at least average, you're not going to be able to move the ball. So I, I, I obviously – we chose Alex Highsmith, but Donnie, going with Tevin Dotson, you were 100% spot on as well. I mean, there's, there's arguments to be made for everybody, and Kevin Dotson, like we've said – Arguably their best offensive lineman last year. He he needs to be their best offensive lineman this year, and I, I think he has the tools to be able to. And uh, he, like you said, he needs to be the leader on that offensive line because this is a this is a young offensive line, and and it's very inexperienced, especially for the positions that everybody is going to be playing. Yeah, I, if somebody had asked me the other day what's kind of the right word to describe the Steelers' offensive line heading into twenty twenty one. Unproven. An unproven for sure. We we know we know the talents that are there on the offensive line. It, there's genuine excitement you could make for every position on that offensive line, but until we actually see it come to fruition on the field, it's all hype at that point. And you know, kind of touching, circling back, you know, full circle on the question. I don't really think there's a wrong answer, you know, to what what second year player needs to take the biggest step because if Highsmith takes that leap and is a monster like Dupree was, then the the, the Steelers will be clicking on all cylinders. You know, you, you really don't have to worry about that other side of TJ Watt. You know, like you know, you, you might have to wonder. And I, I think Smitty made a good point. Highsmith is going to be tested early, man. Like, there's going to be a lot of one on ones that he's going to have to win early on in the season because if I'm a team, yeah, I'm, I'm going to commit, excuse me, a tight end and a tackle to T.J. Watt. And sure, I'll, I'll leave, you know, the second-year dude who played, what, like five or six games last year, you know, still an unproven guy in the NFL. I'll leave him one-on-one -on -one until he proves me otherwise. Um, you know, going back to Kevin Dotson, we already, you know, kind of went on a spiel over him, but, you know, it's still very important for him to kind of take that next step as both a player and a leader in the locker room. And then Chase Claypool, too. I mean, if, if Claypool hits that next year, I mean, we're, we're talking about probably the best wide receiver trio in the league, if not already. And, you know, Smitty already hit the nail on the head. If he learns to, you know, kind of high point the ball and come down with those 50-50 catches in those certain scenarios instead of, you know, trying to draw flags, you know, throw his hands up whenever somebody touches him, I think the Steelers are going to be awfully in business. So I, I think any combination of those three, hopefully all of them take the next step, you know, uh, you know, hopefully it's not just one of them, but uh, I really don't think there's a wrong answer. You know, I, I think all three of them should kind of take that next step heading into 2021. Last question for you guys. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about Mike Tomlin recently. He's actually trending on Twitter uh, yesterday. <laughs> and I think somebody from CBS sports had him as the 10th best coach in the NFL. And it's always really, I'll call it interesting, talking about Tomlin, 
with people from Pittsburgh. You either love them or you hate them. There's really no in between. I mean, what the guy has done since coming to the team in 2007 is basically unparalleled throughout the league, except for some guy uh, in New England that we probably won't talk about for you know very much longer. The, the word success is a very um, volatile word. You know, it, it has a bunch of definitions. You know, there's not one singular definition of success outside of a Lombardi trophy, which, you know, all three of us know can't happen every year, you know, especially for a team like the Steelers. And if, if I'm keeping it honest with you guys and everybody listening right now, I don't think a Lombardi trophy comes back home to Pittsburgh this year. I, I, I don't see the Steelers winning the Super Bowl. Which leads me to my question for you guys. What do you think has to be done for the Steelers in 2021 to have a quote unquote successful year? Good. Well, first off, I'll just say going into the season, I was not expecting Tomlin to get the extension that he did. And maybe I should have seen it coming because, you know, the Steeler way and all that such. But in my opinion, what I would have done with the, with Tomlin is I would have given him this year and I would have said, okay, we, we, we've seen the lack of success um, throughout the past decade. Now I get it. You've never lo- you've never had a losing season, but winning three playoff games in a decade, I don't really know if that really makes up for all the losing seasons or not non losing seasons. So I would have just gone into this being like, okay, you have this year, show me something different otherwise we can cut ties after it that's not the case but in order to for me to say that they had a successful season for one i think i I, maybe this is me being picky because i don't even know how how well much of a playoff team i consider the steelers compared to like other teams in the afc but like i think i would be happy if they made it past round one of the playoffs um but so like that would probably be my my definition of success. Like if you if you lose in the if you make the playoffs and then you lose in round one, I'm used to that. I've seen that a lot. That, that's not going to impress me. So it, I think you have to at least win one game in the playoffs to really consider yourself a successful season. Yeah, here's the thing: is this is such a like this is completely based off what I think of the team this year because I know that there's people that are saying like um, Trevor Sikama, right? He said. Yeah. If the Steelers go 500 this year, put Tomlin in the Hall of Fame while he's still coaching. And then there's us talking about it, whereas Donnie said, like, even if Alex Highsmith is an average player, this defense should still be right around a top five unit. If you feel that way, I still feel while Ben is not that same elevator of talent, he can still facilitate enough with the weapons that he has for this offense and this is completely being hopeful again with with a new offensive coordinator, a new offensive line coach, and a completely rebuilt offensive line. I feel like this unit can be league average. To go along with this defense, I still think that they are going to be in contention for a playoff spot, especially with this playoff spot added as of last year. So for me, that's great and all, but like Tyler, in order to consider it a successful season, I think you got to get past that first round of the playoffs. Because we've seen them as the favorite now in multiple playoff positions, playoff appearances in a row, lose to a team that they had no business losing to. Now, granted, if you bring Sean Spence off the couch to play 80% of the snaps have been a linebacker in 2017 like the Steelers did, you deserve to lose that playoff game against Jacksonville. If you put up 42 points and lose, then you deserve to lose that game. This Cleveland game completely different there was not a reason when going into that game for anybody to believe that cleveland could win that game in pittsburgh without their head coach everything going against them starters resting come out about the top yeah and yet yeah. cleveland still comes out on top in that playoff game so like tyler just three playoff wins in the last decade and again this like people are gonna think that i'm anti tomlin because of this i'm not i love coach tomlin i i get the argument like you know if not him, then who? Are we going to find somebody that's more successful? Obviously, all the players love him. They buy in very quickly. He's a great motivator of men. He's great in the locker room. The question with him has always been on the field during game day, how good of an X and O's coach is he? How good is he with managing a game? And with how often he has that hand in that defense for the defensive performances that we've seen despite having the elite talent, 
especially in this game against Cleveland. I understand Highsmith goes down. We had to see Cassius Marsh play a starting position for them. But still, when you have the secondary that they have, when you have the defensive line that they have, just inexcusable performances in the playoffs recently. So while I think that it still would be moderately impressive for the Steelers to win like 11 games with this roster, if they were to do that, to me, it means nothing if they don't win at least one playoff game. Exactly. Yeah. And, and <sighs> Pittsburgh is one of those cities where no matter what the roster looks like, they expect to play in a parade every second week of February, no matter what. You know, the Steelers, I can't remember the last time the Steelers have quote unquote rebuilt because mm-hmm. it, it, it's always been reloading. And, you know, Mike Tomlin has been a very big part of that. You know, everybody loves to throw out the stat that he's never had a losing season since he came here. Um, I think he has the second highest win percentage in the NFL behind Bill Belichick since coming into the league as a head coach in 2007. He's led the Steelers to, to uh, two Super Bowls for granted. That was over a decade ago. You know, what the NFL has continuously been a what have you done for me now kind of league. And just looking at the results that not only Tomlin, but, you know, we have to remember, sure, Tomlin doesn't get all, you know, of the of the love or of the hate. But Tomlin has largely, largely, excuse me, been responsible for holding on to coordinators for too long. He's been largely responsible for trusting too much into his coordinators. So people have to remember, like, Tomlin should take a little bit of that blame as well. You know, I, I think some of the performances on the field that Tomlin can't control, but I think holding on to Rain Fickner for an extra year, I think Keith Butler still being in a head position. Granted, I didn't expect Keith Butler to be fired with how the defense has played. Uh, side note, I think Minka Fitzpatrick saved that man's job, but that's a whole other topic. I, I think with the mismanagement of the defense year after year, you know, people like you and I, and Noah and everybody else who watches the Steelers see it. I think Tomlin has to take some responsibility for that. So I think we need to be real. I said earlier that I don't expect the Steelers to win the Super Bowl. I don't think they can compete with a roster like Kansas City. I don't think they can compete with a roster like Buffalo. I'll level with you guys right now. I don't think they win the division. I think Cleveland looks like the superior team in the division right now as we speak. Obviously, things could change. But if I had to put money on a team winning the AFC North, it's going to be the Browns. They they somehow they were a very good team heading into last year, and I think they only got better through the offseason. On paper, I might put them ahead of Buffalo, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think if they were to meet the playoffs, I think that'd be a phenomenal game. So I, I think the AFC, um, and you know, it's, do you think they could beat the Titans in the playoff game? You know, do, do we think they could get past the Ravens? Granted, I think the Ravens got a little bit worse over the offseason, but you know, whenever it comes to the playoffs, you know, certainly divisional games, especially after what we saw last year, I'm not confident, you know, in, in week 17 last year, the, the Steelers hung on with the Browns playing their full squad on the road and barely lost that game. They return home to Pittsburgh with their rested starters. And then they lay a goose egg, you know, mm-hmm. I don't know if it's just being pessimistic. I don't know if it's me trying to, you know, fine tune my actual reality goggles when everybody else seems to think the Steelers are going to make a Super Bowl run this year. I, I think I'm with you guys. I think one playoff win this year, just show me something. Show me you can win a playoff game, and then all my confidence and faith will be restored. And then after that playoff win, if you don't win a Super Bowl, then we could take a look at the small things we need to tweak to move forward. But with the team's current roster, the defense built to win now, Ben Roethlisberger slowly but surely losing the battle with father time, and, you know, having X amount of games left in his career, you need to capitalize on that now. So I I think, in my opinion, a short playoff run would do it for me. Here, Here's the thing. Like, I've always been – and I'm glad that you brought it up because it didn't even, like, occur to me. I actually wrote a whole article about it with, with Tomlin's biggest – my biggest critique of him has been the coordinators. Because yeah. you mentioned – uh, Randy Feetner. I would even go a step further than that, where I wasn't the biggest fan of Todd Haley. And I know that the offense put up great numbers, but with it was with elite talent, they were terrible in the red zone, even with that talent at the time. To me, it was just carried by elite talent, and I'm so upset that we hung the best years of this offense and tied the prime years and last few good years of Ben Roethlisberger's career and being able to elevate that talent to these offensive coordinators. Because now we're in this position where, yeah, I'm hopeful, you know, a guy like Matt Canada can come in and at least have this this offense at league average. Um, but, you know, imagine if we would have had a guy with this type of creativity back when we had the pieces in a quarterback specifically bees, man. that could run that offense. To, yeah, imagine Matt Canada with the killer bees. 
And, you know, there's a reason that Matt Canada wasn't an offensive coordinator at that time, but it's just the Steelers got hip to the NFL trend too late. You know, it seems like they've finally caught up, but it's too late now. That's why I think the biggest question mark to me is, like, how good is the Steelers team going to be? We have no idea. I feel like we have no idea how this offense is going to perform based off of the offense should look completely different. Um, and I think the Steelers could finish first just as easily as I think they could finish third in the division. And so it's really hard for me to place, like, engage what the success of this team should be because – Listen, like 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 you guys and like everybody else. As much as I would love the Steelers to win the Super Bowl, I just don't see it happening. Um, but and I could see them missing the playoffs. That's that's where it's like you kind of have to rationalize what you expect out of this team. And since there's so many question marks going into the season, I think it's it's a safe judgment to say winning the playoff game would be the success because I mean it's something we haven't had in a few years. Yeah, and you know, j- just kind of pulling up the end of the Steelers schedule. Um, obviously, whenever the schedule got released, um, it came out the Steelers had, uh, at least from opponent records from the year prior, the hardest schedule in the NFL. I'm trying to pull it up right now. I, I have no idea how hard it is to find schedules like this. There we go. Um, so the, to end the season, they have a stretch where they have to play with Baltimore week 13 on the road at Minnesota, back home against the Titans, on the road at Kansas City, back home to play the Browns, and then on the road against the Baltimore Ravens to finish out the year. If they're able to navigate that and then somehow go make a Super Bowl run, I think statues of Tomlin need to be erected outside of Heinz Field. I think Ben Roethlisberger, his statue needs to go, and probably Mika and TJ too. That's a gauntlet at the end of the season. The good news for the Steelers is I will be there for those home games. So, Love it. (laughs) <laughs> also, Smitty, you touched on uh, – I'm blanking on his name – him saying that if they go 500 this year that – Trevor Sycamore. Yeah. yeah. I mean, are we just forgetting 2019 was a thing? Uh, if he's expect, I, not expecting them to go 500 with this team in th- this season, like yeah. how did anybody expect Listen, them to go 500 only, that year? They've only had, what, one losing season in the last 20-some years? I mean – it was like 2002 or three. Something Listen, like that. again, I understand you look at the schedule. It is very daunting. But, you know, for as badly as we've talked about, as, as badly as it seems that we've talked about this team in this episode where people are like, oh, these guys think the Steelers are going to be terrible. Yeah. I still think, like I said, I still think that they are going to be in contention for a playoff spot. And I think that it's gotten to the point with, like, national media where they're kind of underrating the Steelers at this point. Like people saying, I just saw today about somebody picking the Bengals to be higher. I saw them say the Steelers at five and twelve. I mean, I just, I have, a, I have a harder time buying into that than I do them winning twelve or thirteen games. Yeah, if if if, if you're making me put down money on the Steelers either winning twelve or thirteen games or going five and twelve, I'm going to bet the money on them going, you know, twelve and twelve and five, thirteen and four, you know, whatever weird number comes with that extra regular season. It sounds so weird to hear to hear you say. <laughs> yeah, Twelve and five just sounds so wrong. <laughs> sounds so wrong. Gentlemen, it has absolutely been a pleasure. It's always phenomenal chopping up Steelers talk with you guys. Go ahead and follow all Steelers on Twitter at SI underscore Steelers. Go ahead and give our YouTube page a subscribe all Steelers talk. Find our website allsteelers.com or NFL.com slash sorry si.com slash nfl slash Steelers. i'm butchering it up today uh boys if you have anything you want to plug please go ahead uh the only thing i'll say is the most important thing that we do tomorrow rocking around the 412 year four kicks off so we're super excited for that oh, oh and uh let's see what we're at right now just to oh we're seven here. away seven seven followers seven. away ten thousand so. as of this moment by the time people watch this i assume we'll be there but yeah hopefully <laughs> yeah, that's the only but thing no, I want to plug. Uh, Go follow around the 412 on Twitter, Instagram. We have a Facebook page if you want to like that. Go subscribe to Around the 412 on YouTube as well. Um, hit the notification bell. Just yeah. put on the videos in the background. We don't care. Just watch the videos whenever you see them. <laughs> you can right, mute guys. them. It doesn't matter. Thank you so much. It's been Donnie. It's been Smitty. It's been Tyler. It's been real. And we will see you next week.